Hey there, listeners. Thanks for stopping by to the podcast today. Please, before you're done listening to this episode, leave us a review. If you're on Spotify, you can review now, and you can also review on Apple Podcasts. But if there's any platforms that I'm forgetting about and you can leave us a review, please do so. If you're happening to watch this on YouTube, and if you don't know, you can watch these podcasts on YouTube now, uh, please like and subscribe to the channel and share the episode as well. So thanks for stopping by, everybody, and enjoy the episode. Stay hungry, stay foolish. We choose to go to the moon in this decade and do the other thing, not because they are easy, but because they are hard. I have a dream. We one day live in a nation where they will not be judged by the color of their skin, but by the content of their character. Hello and welcome back to the Knowledge is Power podcast. I'm your host, Max Willett, and today we got another great guest on. So if you could go ahead and introduce yourself, that would be great. Well, I'm Luis Zayas. I'm a part-time resident of Charlestown, Rhode Island, and the other part-time is Austin, Texas. Very cool. Uh, so I actually met Luis through uh, the Vintage Cigar Lounge, and if listeners remember, about over a little over a year ago, I had the uh, current owner's Greg Williams and Tom Clune on the podcast, and they talked about how they created Vintage. And uh, I met Luis through the Cigar Lounge, and I'm producing a podcast for Vintage. So this is the first time I'm giving Smoke Signals a shout-out on my podcast. Mm -hmm. Uh, First pilot episode's up, so you guys want to check that out. I'll link link that in the description of this podcast. But uh, yeah, so that's sort of how I met Luis. Um, I guess my dad sort of introduced us, and it's just gone from there. So... Just like how we do every podcast, let's just get right into it. Let's hear your life story. All right. Well, uh, you know, I've never been asked that question about my life story. So it's it's uh, where does one begin? Except that um, I was born in Puerto Rico okay. and grew up there the early part of my life. My father was in the military, so we moved around a lot. And like any of your viewers who are uh, army brats, military brats, they know that every three years... You move from one place, your dad or your mom gets orders to be, you know, somewhere else and the family follows. Mm -hmm. And that was pretty much um, how it went through the time that I was a teenager. And in that time, I was able to, uh, my father essentially took us out of a very poor uh, uh, situation. We were impoverished and he, in the military, he was able to get us out. And that, that changed our lives. Came to Richmond, Virginia. And from there, we moved to Massachusetts, from Massachusetts uh, to, to Munich, Germany. And I think what's important to know about this, uh, I'm pretty old, and this was about 15 years after the, the, the Second World War. So it was 1960, 59, that we were in Germany. And still all around us were the remnants of World War II. Munich was still a city not yet rebuilt. Mm-hmm. And as part of my daily trek to on the school bus, was to, we would cut through uh, downtown Munich to get to the military, to the uh, Department of Defense schools that they had for kids. And uh, every day I would drive, be driven by on the bus uh, through se- the center of Munich. And there were still bombed out buildings in the, at that point, wow. surrounded by barbed wire. We learned that many of the buildings were uh, uh, endangered. They were about to collapse. So they wanted kids to stay away from, from them, uh, people in general. But also there were live munitions that had been unexploded. Now, you're talking about 15 years. You figure, why doesn't the city get... In- you know, to get it together in 15 years. Well, it was it was 15 years, and it takes much more than that. So mm-hmm. they had to just get their commerce started, their educational system, healthcare system started. So it was it was uh, the focus, and I think that had a, a really great impression on me with respect to what happens when when destruction happens to people mm. in their lives. And as a result of that, I've always been interested in world World War II and post World War II um, history and and what people lived through. So I like to read memoirs and histories and biographies. Um, about people's experiences during the war, whether it was the war in the Pacific or the war in, in Europe. And I think those that kind of travel just simply changed my life because one of the things it's done, it's I never stay anywhere for very long. Mm. I always move uh, from one place to the next because of the experience that, my, that I had growing up. There was another thing that kids today may not know, but in those days you actually had to write letters to your friends to keep in touch. So what happened was that, you know, when you leave a military base and you promise your friends you're going to write 
and then you write the first letter and a month later maybe the second and by there's no third letter usually mm. because there's not much to to do um and so consequently I, I lost a lot of friends along the way my oldest friends um are actually from graduate school that's when you know, I began, actually it was from college, but but I don't keep in touch with them. I, no, actually they do. They, st they are still around. So from college, I don't have childhood friends because we all moved around. And if you know anything about military life, you, even if you go back to the base where you just moved from, uh, you're not going to see anybody there that was there when you were there because mm. their parents have been moved on. So it always changes. It's not like coming back to your town and going to the same grocer or the gas station or the people working there, you recall. It's, it's very different. So that really influenced my life. And as a consequence, I just, I've been moving ever since, sometimes in the same place, 34, 44 years actually in New York City, just different jobs in different neighborhoods. Mm -hmm. But that was, that was part of it. So those are the early uh, uh, times in my life. And I know that uh, that period in, in Munich, Germany, when you're 10 to 13 years old, I mean, your mind is just absorbing everything and taking it all in. And it was, it was quite Quite an experience. Do you remember those images of the city very well? Oh, like, very well, yeah. very clearly. And, and what was interesting is I became a psychologist, you know, and, and, and a social worker. And I recall that we, as the young boys in class, uh, we were in this old warehouse, Nazi warehouse, that was now converted into American school. And at lunchtime, we ate indoors, uh, and we just reset our, our desks. And the boys tended to sit around... And what did we do during lunch but draw? And most of the drawings were depictions of war. Mm. So we would we would show battle scenes and airplanes, diving, bombing, and things like that. Um, and we would also draw depictions of, of mountains cut, kind of, you know, the way you have an anthill right in a, in a pane of glass. Sorry about that. No, that's okay. I'll, I'll fix it. it. Keep talking. I'll fix it. Um, so the depiction of... of uh, Ant farms, we see, but we would have in the in there. Uh, okay, yeah, there. Sorry. Yeah. Okay. We would be showing battle scenes, but within the mountains, there were these carves out of of garages and tanks and military munitions, all sorts of things. And it was only later, when I studied psychology, that I realized what we were going through. We were, as young boys, processing what we were living, because we couldn't make sense of it. And I think part of the the way we children do is they express themselves through drawings and play and that's how i think many of us dealt with the fact that we were seeing war and its consequences up front mm. it was it was still it's still there in my memory as you can see i can tell you very quickly it comes up because that was so have important. you been back to germany since oh yes yes yeah. and i went back to the the places that i could recall where i lived and uh, it's much smaller now, right? Yeah. When you're a kid, everything seems large. Yeah. And I, th I thought I'd go back to this neighborhood with a lot of ample space, but the buildings were actually more crowded. But it's so funny that you say that. It's like I have very limited experience with that sort of phenomenon. Mm -hmm. Like when we graduated high school, we went to our elementary school, and I remember the hallways just being so much bigger. Yes. And I go in there, I'm like, this is like tiny. Yes. Yes. <laughs> I'm just yes. like, but yeah, sorry, go ahead. Yeah. Well, no, that was, that was it. I, I went back. Um, and at the time that when we lived there, there was a, uh, an old SS building, I believe it was SS building, you know, cobblestone, uh, uh, courtyard, these massive buildings all around it. Uh, and that was then taken over by the U S military, of mm -hmm. course, when, you know, after, uh, after 45 and my dad's military company, uh, was, uh, 24th Infantry Division was was housed there and we would go there and you could you know you could almost envision you know the the Nazi uh, uh, army parading there doing their things there because it was just alive history was alive in a way that I don't think I've experienced it since in the same way and perhaps also with the youthfulness you know when your your mind is opening and you're awakening to things and so that that's been I think very instrumental and in understanding oh and here's another so that was you know some of those stories, and I've been back, but there was a time when my mother would buy, um, uh, I don't know, scarves and sweaters that were hand handmade uh, by this woman that would come by every so often, knock on the door. Maybe, to me, it was a kid. Maybe every once a month, maybe every three months. My mom would, my mom didn't speak German mm. and much English. The woman didn't speak Spanish or English, only German. But somehow they managed to communicate. And it was, I remember sitting next to my mom one day as she haggled with this woman. It was lovely. It was just watching two women. They were doing commerce in vastly different languages. And I'm sitting next to her. And somehow 
the conversation between my mom and this woman turned to the woman's experience during World War II because she was now, this woman could have been in her 40s, but she could have been in her 60s. Mm. What did I know? I was 10, 11 mm. years old. They all look old to me. Mm. And she showed my mom, She it turned out she was a, uh, uh, they called them gypsies at, at the time, um, but it's a gypsy woman. And she lifted her, her uh, sleeve and showed my mom the tattoo numbers oh that, uh, that the Nazis had imprinted on her, and that was the that was the number, uh, and that you know uh, that would determine when she would die, uh, in nearby in Dachau, which is near near um, uh, Munich, and that was just extraordinary because I remember her sagging skin, the skin of an older woman, but the 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 tattooed numbers on yeah. there. I don't remember what the numbers were, but I was struck. It's those moments when I think, you know, that part of why I became who I became mm. had its impact, right? Because you see the war around you, the devastation. Children, not any of the kids that I knew, but kids, American kids, who had found, you know, ha a little uh, 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 tunnels and things around the. We would go into this woods and play. Uh, inside of there were were tunnels made by the the German the Nazis where they would store helmets and boots and things like that. But there were also live munitions, and some children lost limbs. You know, they find something, they grab it, and it exploded. Um, so there was that, and all around you, people were saying, "Don't go near." If you see something called the MPs, the military police, that's what we were told to do because it was a danger. So you you, you know you're 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 alive at that point, right? You're mm. you're aware of these things, and um, and so it, it just, you know, it was it what it was uh, very in, in instructive, and I think it affected, you know, who I became. Yeah, and my I, interest in people and, and and caring for those who suffer. Absolutely. I mean, I mean, I I don't I wouldn't say I'm I'm fascinated, but I'm definitely interested in that sort of period mm -hmm. of history, uh, like the how like the technology and like what the Germans were doing. Mm -hmm. It was, it's almost uncomprehensible, like for me to, cause it's so far away. It's, I've never been to Germany. I've never been, mm -hmm. you know, outside of the East coast of United States, you know? Sure. So it just, it's interesting to hear somebody that was there not too long after it. Like, yeah. thank yeah. you for sharing that. And, well, and one, one, just one tidbit when, um, when I was living there, cause you say, you know, have I gone back? Mm. And when we were living there, both as a part of a school trip and as a family trip, I visited the Dachau concentration center twice as a kid. Uh, and what I do remember was the smell. It the, was still there. There was a, there was a smell, you know, traces of smell. I I don't know what it, what death smells like, but it didn't smell right. You know, yeah. I'm, I'm an 11 year old with a pretty good nose for smells, and I, I remember that. In 2015, I packed my family, uh, and we all went to Germany. I wanted my kids to to see it. So we retraced my steps, and one of the things we did was visit Dachau. Now, this is their first time there. This is my, you know, second time, but uh, decades later, the smell was gone. Mm. I mean, naturally, right? Sun, air, and things like that. But my kids were astonished. I, I The smell that I smelled back in 1960 was not there anymore. What I smelled in 1960 was still death uh, wow. and destruction. Uh, and so just, just, you know, where, where, you know, history comes together with sights sens and sensations in this case, smell. Yeah. Um, the, the smell of the, um, cause they, they would have, uh, uh, the uniforms, the, the of the, the prisoners, uh, the concentration camp, uh, victims hanging in so that they, they, you know, exuded the smell, um, they, they emitted the smell of, of whatever the, their sweat, you know, yeah. all of the things around them. It was gone by 2015, as you can imagine, mm. you know, decades later. But it was it was quite something. So you're taking me down memory lane here. Max. Yeah. Yeah. Well, was, I know this is a, like, I don't know if you would remember this, but when you were in Germany as a kid, were there people there that were still sort of like Nazi sympathizers that you met, like came across still like like racism, like 
blatantly from German citizens. Was that still around when you were there? Or? I'm sure it was. I'm sure there were the Nazis who were hiding. Yeah. Uh, this is 1959 to 63. I'm sure there were. As yeah. a kid, I would not have known them. No. Nor at that time would they have come out because the U.S. Army's presence was everywhere yeah. in the country. Uh, there were bases, you know, in Munich, Augsburg, you know, Frankfurt, you name it. It was all over. So um, I don't think they did. Interestingly, though, in 2015, when we went back and uh, when I went back with my family and showed them around, we also drove um, uh, into Aust- Austria, into Innsbruck. And we were walking through this neighborhood, my daughter and I, and there uh, on the wall graffiti said, Nazi Schwein, you know, not Nazi pig, and an arrow pointing to an apartment. So there was something going on in that neighborhood with someone mm. as identified as a Nazi. Now, it's not the Nazis of the, 19, uh, mm. the 1950s and 60s. But it was interesting because there's still there's still attention to that sort of thing and who is and who isn't. Mm. We see now the far right in Germany doing lots of things, so there might be a resurgence of it. Um, but yeah, at the time there must have been, but I didn't. I would not have known it because I was you know as a kid. Yeah, I was just interested to ask that, but that's crazy. I didn't know that. that yeah. you, were there so Germany? Were there any other places that you moved to around, like like sort of? you know, historical places uh, like that? Uh, no, Munich is probably the most historic. I mean, New York City is very historic, mm. but uh, the that was probably the one that, that, you know, sticks in my mind most, both because of the the, the, the period in history, but also the period in my own development where mm-hmm. I was taking this all in. Uh, but yeah, that's that's pretty much. I mean, I've been to other places, fortunately, and I, I'm not a traveler. In other words, I don't, when, when there's vacations, I'd rather just go to a small town and hang out with the locals. But because of my business, I've traveled a lot. Mm. And, um, and that has brought me to South America, to Asia, Europe, uh, Africa, North Africa, and places like that. So you realize, you know, how similar we are. Different customs, different attire, different food, but we're all the same. So my, my, um, my experience as a, as a psychologist and a social worker is around teenagers and child yep. development. And, you know, um, we talk about the generation gap between kids and their parents, every culture has them. I yeah. Mean, you know, wherever you go, parents are arguing with their kids about the same similar things mm. as our kids. So we're no difference. The kids want to defy their parents. Their parents say, no, do it this way. Uh, whether I've been in Brazil and I've, I've seen that, uh, we visited a family in, um, in Brazil, one of the colleagues at the university there, and her son was playing some game gaming video gaming with somebody somewhere in other part of the world and the parents were trying to get him off to come to dinner like any teenager he said no no hold on hold on you know i mean he was saying it in portuguese but it was the same as as an american kid said hold on i'm going to finish this game i have to you know defeat this particular uh uh adversary or whatever mm, it is in the mm. video game and i've seen that in so many places that it's it's you know, there's there's a lot of similarities among us yeah so all right you moved to to germany when you were 11, mm-hmm. 12 years old. So where did you go after that? Then we returned and we uh, moved to, my father was stationed in Fort Dix, New Jersey. Okay. And we were there for a little while. It was from there that he that he retired. At this point, he had six kids and, uh, and the Vietnam War, War was just really starting to rage. And he had already put in his 21 years and he thought, this is not the time for me to go get killed and leave six mm. kids uh, orphaned uh, with my mom. So that's when he stepped down. But uh, and those were great. By that time, I'm in high school, you know, and I'm getting interested in girls and things like that. Um, but that was, you know, that was just another military base. It was nothing uh, exceptional about it, except that it was South Jersey and Fort Dix, but nothing really exciting. And at that point, um, we returned to Puerto Rico. Uh, and within a year or two, my, one of my sisters married, decided she was going to come back stateside. Mm-hmm. Uh, and ultimately, all of the kids followed. And we all came states. At that point, my parents said, well, they're not going to stay in Puerto Rico. So they moved to Miami, and, mm-hmm. uh, and we've been here ever since. But I think, you know, and, and it was from there that I went to college in New York. And it was, now we're talking about the late 60s. And a lot of things were happening, you know, the civil rights, the Vietnam War. A lot of things were happening. You just And in New York City, you were living that experience every day. Um, and, and I was away from home for the first time on my own, right? And so 
Uh, I had to manage a large city and a college. It was a, uh, it was a great college, Manhattan College, uh, in, which is in the Bronx, actually, Riverdale section of the Bronx, and it's run by the, uh, then the Irish Christian Brothers, and I, I felt really supported there. And mm. They, I, you know, as a student from far away and no family nearby, and so weekends were, what do I do on weekends? Everybody was, you know, gone to their homes and their pla places, but um, I became part of that college community and that really helped at least give me a stable base and it was like that for another six years mm. uh, while I was there and, and stayed on as a, a resident assistant and um, but there you know it was again all of the all of the things of riding the subway and you know trying to uh, eke out a living so uh, working in kitchens and restaurants uh, and the one the one place that I quit immediately when the guy would the owner would say someone sent back a salad that they hadn't finished he said just wash it off and we'll serve it to the next customer oh god <laughs> I said, no wait when his presence i washed the lettuce but as soon as i could i said i'll never go back and never oh went back gosh. to that restaurant because i learned something so i i hope that no one else does that no other restaurant tour does that but uh every yeah. everybody should work in a restaurant for a limited amount of time just to realize that you need to, you know, work a little harder so that you don't work in a restaurant yeah. for the rest of I worked at a restaurant and for the sake of the restaurant, I'm not going to say the name of it, mm -hmm. but people who know me know the restaurant mm -hmm. and I hated, I was a dishwasher, worst job I've ever had. And it made me realize that, you know, like, Hey, like you got to get your butt into gear. You got to work hard so that you're not doing stuff like this for the rest of your life. That's right. And, uh, yeah, I, and I, and I worked at a trash company and cleaned out porta johns for a couple of summers. I would rather do that than go be a dishwasher. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I'm like, yeah. that goes yeah. to show you how, how much I dislike doing that. But yeah, yeah, you're right. Everybody should do it. Yeah. At least once. In I life. do remember uh, this was, I was a teenager at this point, you know, 16 years old, and we were living in uh, 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 Fort Dix, and next to it was McGuire Air Force Base. And I was able to get a busing job in the restaurant as, as, uh, uh, passengers were moving on flying military uh, uh, aircrafts to different parts of the country. And it was very really satisfying. And one of them was, was a moment when a mom was traveling with her three or four kids, and they were young. Poor thing, her, her husband would have been wherever he was, mm -hmm. uh, waiting for his family to arrive, and he probably setting up quarters. And there were moments, you know, when too many kids and a mom's distress and the kid vomits or something. I remember one incident where the kid got sick right there in the restaurant, and I was able to help her and her gratitude and her sense of relief, but also the distress, you know, that here's a mom with mm -hmm. young kids, her husband's not there, her partner's not there to help out. Um, and you, you get a sense of satisfaction when you help somebody. And Absolutely. That was the one thing that I enjoyed. But that was earlier on when I went into the kitchen in the Bronx that the, wanted me to rewash the letters. That's when it was all over. But you're right. Mm -hmm. I think uh, I, I, I worked in a 7-Eleven and... Uh, as well, you, you come in contact with people, those who are uh, haughty and but some who have money, and then those who are really kind and, you know, and humble, and uh, you, you tend to, to like them and want to help them out. And you, ever, you, you ever run into any mobsters in New York? Yes, if, if I went to any of the uh, restaurants that they, they owned, and I remember one, one of them where the guy sat at a corner table all day, gaining weight, enormous amount of weight, but, you know, you could see the guys come in, and visit with him a little bit, and then they'd leave, but he would sit at that table. That was the extent of it. Yeah. That was the extent of it. Yeah, that's interesting. Yeah. yeah. I, I Ever since, I mean, I watched The Godfather for the first time last year, loved it. And ever since then, I think I've just been, like, obsessed with learning a little bit more about, you know, the mafia and the history. It's just kind of fascinating to see it. I mean, it's fascinating. It's obviously very tragic because uh, – most of them, if not all of them, were psychopaths. <laughs> yeah. You know, to be completely blunt, I'm sorry if you're a mobster and you're listening to this, but... <laughs> yeah. But they took care of their families. They did. However one defined families. Yeah. yeah. Uh, that's. I guess that's a way of looking at it, is they did yeah. take care of their families. Yeah. Um, but yeah, all right. So you're in New York. Mm -hmm. uh, you work at that restaurant. You're in college. What happened after that? And, you know, it... I, I got to college and I was in my fourth year. I majored in economics and I didn't really know what I wanted to do. I still didn't know what I wanted to do. And I knew that it would be something in the area of a helping profession. How I would help, I didn't know. Would it be through law? So that was a, that was a possibility. And, uh, or, you know, through journalism. I thought about journalism. Uh, and through social work and psychology. And that's ultimately the route I took. 
and went to college, uh, did my graduate work at Columbia and uh, went on to the PhD there. And the, I, I think, you know, all of the, the, the cumulative events, those moments, like I was telling you before, the, you know, the, what it was like in Germany, what I saw in, you know, on, the, on that woman's tattooed uh, arm and, and the concentration camps and then the poverty that I was seeing in the South Bronx working in those areas. Um, it was it was kind of natural that I would move into that mm. into that area, and it was you know I'm, I'm glad I did. I I worked uh, I worked in hospitals in the east uh, in Spanish Harlem in the South Bronx, um, and also at some other shishi uh, upscale ho uh, hospitals in the e Upper East Side. You know uh, where wealthy people come in, uh, and there was a, a certain in both cases. I mean, you feel a sense of the rewards of working for people and helping them. Um, but something about the, those who have less always attracted me because, you know, it was, I felt that what, what, what little progress I could make was substantial progress for them in, in helping them mm. uh, change their lives. And so it was natural. It was, what was interesting too, is that, um, I heard life stories and there was a real privilege. People would, you know, share with you, uh, all of the things that they'd gone through and you, you realize how, Life, whatever life throws at you, you know, that determines how you're going to, you know, how you're going to react and what length you will go to. And it's places like the South Bronx. And then later when I, uh, I was recruited to Washington University in St. Louis when working in a free clinic there uh, with a lot of migrants from uh, Mexico, undocumented uh, immigrants from Mexico, uh, what they had struggled through to get to where they are just to be able to put food on the table and get their kids educated mm -hmm. uh, and you really appreciate what it's like and so it took me back to biblical times right when you, know, you have the, the 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 migration to the promised land and migration has gone on since the beginning of time people have migrated uh and it's it's seldom because they want to just up and go it's more because there were government uh uprisings and violence there was persecution, uh, whether religious or, or otherwise, um, famine, drought, things like that that just drove people out. And so it's been happening all along the history. And, uh, and so I, I know what it's like for a person to leave the place that they were born at, you know, in, born in, and uh, that they love and their loved ones are there. It's, it's a hard thing to do. Uh, in fact, in, in, uh, what, in doing the research for my latest book, um, I, I learned that the average human being on this earth uh, lives within four miles of where they were born. The average. We're talking about mm. average, right? Some of us have moved far away. In the United States, because of its transportation and thing, things, you know, uh, uh, and, and, and uh, economic mobility, the the chances are that an American will live within 17 and 44 miles of the place of their birth and grow up there. Uh, so people don't necessarily want to migrate. Mm. They want to stay where they're comfortable every day. They can walk, they wake up, familiar people, familiar places, safety, security, a sense of continuity, predictability of what life is like. Um, they don't usually want to leave. When they leave, it's either because of vast you know, economic opportunity or because it's it's time to go because something's wrong, mm. right? and so when we see now we see migration in a different way than we've ever seen it before. In the past, we read about it. Now, with media and you know uh, global communication and media and you you know the twenty four hour news cycle on CNN, MSNBC, Fox, whatever, you see what people go through, and it gives you an appreciation for what it means to leave behind. That those four that four mile wide area that most people would have stayed would have stayed it, but when you ask what drives them, it's not that um, they just wanted to up and go. They're they're fleeing something, uh, and we do know that uh, whether it's crossing the Mediterranean in that area and the dangers of that, or or crossing deserts like the Sonoran Desert and you know to get to the United States or any other place from, whether it's migration within the same continent as we have in within Africa and then. Africa to Europe or South America to North America. Um, it's seldom, it's seldom because people just want up and out mm -hmm. It's more often than not. Uh, so over the past few years, I've been doing, 
uh, both uh, research and clinical work with uh, immigrants and immigrant children, most of those who are asylum seeking from, from Central America and South America. And when I would interview moms, I, I had the chance to interview many of them when they were held in immigration detention in, in Carnes City, Texas, and in Dilly, Texas, which are the two uh, places where kids and moms were held, and in some cases, kids alone. Um, almost to, a, to an adult, they'd say, we didn't want to come here, but we had no choice. Uh, we were fine, you know, living, but whether it was the gangs, and typically it was the violence of the gangs and the complicity of the police, that was um, that drove people out. It um, so let's say if there was domestic violence in a in a family, the woman in most cases had no one to turn to because if she turned to the police, they were corrupt, and her abuser was already paying them off or was part of that system or knew the guys and and that sort of thing really um, affected uh, affected the you know them and so for that reason they left, and so um, I have an appreciation for what. You know, migration doesn't pay. Perhaps also because of my own migratory world, my I might still have been in Puerto Rico had yeah. my father not left. Right? Yeah. Uh, in that in the same four mile square area, or at least an island that's a hundred by thirty, a mm. hundred by fifty. Um, so it's it's I, I have an appreciation for for what that means in the struggles for what you know what people leave and what they come to. Yeah. All right. Let's get into a little bit more detail about your professional career. Mm -hmm. Right. So you graduate college. What's your first job out of college? It was a, a small pediatric uh, uh, rehab hospital. Yeah. With kids we had uh, who had uh, physical disabilities and would be there anywhere from you know a few weeks to a few months, sometimes years, uh, because some kids were abandoned by their families because of the disabilities was just. And so we're talking now about the the mid late seventies and um, learned a lot. I mean, learned again also about you know what people suffer of uh, kids who were just everyday average kids who suffered uh, an infection of some sort to their brain or fell out of a tree and and and, and severed their uh, their spine and were now uh, you know uh, paraplegics in wheel wheelchairs or even worse where there were uh, kids who were undergoing a tonsillectomy something simple and the anesthesiologist blew it and left the kid essentially you know disabled so all of those things and and, and that was that was really instrumental in my development and understanding, mm. you know what what happens to the human body. From there, after about three years, I was recruited to a mental health clinic in in Manhattan, uh, at a prestigious uh, hospital there, affiliated with an Ivy League university, and uh, there too it was kind of the, the psychiatric illness. Now I was moving from the physical physical effects on the body to the mental health, and wow. And also working with some of the top psychiatrists and psychologists in the field. And so there was a lot of learning. I was learning an awful lot and just, you know, taking it in. And did some additional training on the side in psychoanalysis uh, and other uh, 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 forms of, of therapy. Uh, learned from there. And after a few years, I mean, you know, the, the, the one thing, it, I didn't get the same satisfaction as I was getting in other places where... Uh, because many of our uh, the clients in the hospital were Upper East Side people who just you know had a lot of money, mm. uh, but came to that clinic because of its prestige, um, and it wasn't so great. You know, kind of the the, the what you say the the moral rewards for me weren't weren't all that. So I got I was recruited at that point to come back to Columbia and finish my degree, and they said, "Would you teach for us?" I said, "Sure," and I remember. Uh, it was, it was, I, I took a $2,000 pay raise, uh, a pay, pay cut rather. I took a $2,000 pay cut going from the hospital to, to Columbia. And I remember at one point I was applying for a credit card or something. And the woman at the other end of the line was, was saying, but sir, you, you know, you left one place and you took a cut. I said, yeah, but you know, sometimes you take a step back to take four or five, four, because exactly. yes, it was a $2,000 pay cut. But I had June, July, and August free, so yeah. You know, so yeah, but I didn't have to work a twelve month. Uh, but I was getting the same amount, and she got it. Um, and so then I, I was there for for uh, nearly uh, nine years teaching, and did my PhD at the same time, since it was all there as part mm. of my uh, uh, employment package. So I, you know, to be able to do uh, to to get a degree. So I, I did the PhD and and moved on. Well, actually, went back to practice. So all along, I. I I, I crosswalked teaching and research 
and working in the communities. Uh, and at this point, I went back after my uh, my time at Columbia. I, I, while I was at Columbia, I was teaching at a hospital, a public hospital in East Harlem Metropolitan uh, Hospital, which is a public hospital in Spanish Harlem. And again, you're working with people you know, from Harlem, Spanish yeah. Harlem. It was really impoverished, but a great, you know, it was a, a very rewarding for me feeling that I was doing something meaningful. Yeah, I mean, if I'm, I'm, I must say, like, one of my biggest issues with with colleges, I mean, I'm obviously, I mean, I've said on the podcast before, I'm not ashamed to say I'm a college dropout, mm -hmm. you know, and I, uh, I was really interested to hear, you know, what, okay, what are the backgrounds? Let's just say business, for example, business college. How many of these professors have had actual business mm -hmm. experience? People who have either owned their own businesses, been higher ups and, and corporations has actual business experience and it was very few and in order to teach you have to have had experiences mm -hmm. you can't just you like taking a book reading it to kids and calling that teaching is not teaching being able to transcribe your experiences and how you learn from those experiences and then conveying that to students is teaching mm -hmm. so to hear that you we're actually practicing in the field and then teaching is refreshing to hear because I really don't think that's popular. Maybe that's different in, in your type of expertise in those mm -hmm. type of colleges, but me doing l limited research on some local colleges, yeah. why do they why do they get to teach? I have, I'm 21 years old. I have more business experience than these college professors. Mm -hmm. That's right. So... You know, that's just that's just my yeah. critique. But and like, that's, that's the nature of education, yeah. right? They got their PhDs uh, or what have you, and and they're socialized into getting back and, and teaching, and yeah. so they don't necessarily kind of you know ply their trade. They're 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 teaching it. Uh, your your point is a good one, and and I remember a moment uh, when I was at Columbia as a young uh, assistant professor, and. Um, I had just vi come back from a visit uh, with some clients, a student clients, and I was involved in, in part of the, the intervention with the clients. And I'm in the men's room, and in walks a, another faculty member, senior to me, washing my hands. He says, oh, so do you? I said, I said, I just came back from this, and I described quickly the, the situation. I don't even remember what the case was. But I just, mm. and I said, and now I'm going to be teaching, and tomorrow this, this fits perfectly into my lecture for tomorrow's class. And he turns to me and he says, gosh, you know, that's great, you know, I haven't seen a client in 10 years and I'm using the same old cases. And I knew at that moment, kind of, I looked in the mirror as I washed my hands, I don't want to be this guy. Ever. No way. I don't want to ever say, oh, I'm sorry, I, you know, the case I have is 10 years old or 15 years old. And so, um, as a result, I always kept, I always had a, while I was in New York, I had a small private practice. So I was always kind of having my, my hands in it. Lately, I don't have time to, carry patients over time so i do mm. a lot of evaluations mm. um of of people who are in detention in immigration detention or just out or are, are seeking asylum um or who are under under deportation or removal uh by by the courts and i've been engaged by an attorney to evaluate the effects on their children of different you know different scenarios that the court might come up with and so it keeps me active in doing evaluations and then testifying but uh and so then we get the results of that case but i move on to the next so it's mm. it's a different it's different now i don't carry you know patients over a long period of time but it is a way of me keeping in touch with what's happening uh and i wouldn't have any other ways i don't think i think it's unfair to walk into a classroom and and, and talk about theories and research uh, and not be able to say well you know last week i saw a client in which case and then students come alive because now they see you in there. Yes. Uh, and you can role play it in the classroom yeah. and they see you fumble or, you know, you make mistakes and they see it and you tell them, yeah, you don't have to. Yes, I've been in this field 45 years now. Guess what? I still make mistakes, mm -hmm. you know, or I don't hear something that the client said. And so it makes it real to the student and they can appreciate that. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. That was something that, I mean, I went when I started in school, I was going for engineering. And that's very different. Engineers, like, there's a lot of people that go work and then become professors in engineering. So it's different in that sort of sense. But when with the more quote unquote generic, 
I hate to say that, but generic uh, majors, mm-hmm. it seems to be the reoccurring case that the mm-hmm. professors just are reading a book out loud to you guys, to the, yes. their students. And then you're paying an astronomical amount just for that, which is ridiculous because I honestly think nothing beats education. Nothing beats experience. Mm-hmm. You know, that's the ultimate educator is experience. That's right. Not... I mean, sure, you can be book smart. You can tell me that X, Y, Z, this happened in 1984, but you're not going to beat that person that was there experiencing it and 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 telling you what actually happened. Yeah. That's just one example of... No, of no you're right. And in, in graduate social work education, uh, internships are required. Yeah. And by the fourth semester, it's a two-year master's degree, so by the fourth semester, they have to do like you know, actually maybe even the second year, um, 20, 40 hours a week of, of practice. And they are under the supervision of an experienced clinician uh, who's had years of experience in both work, you know, doing the work as well as supervising. Yeah. And students will remember those supervisors long after they remember the, the professor in a classroom because those are the people that taught them how to handle a crisis, how to handle something a client said or did that you didn't understand, and they they bring it to the moment, right, to the alive for you in the clinic, in the hospital, wherever the the student is working. Um, but they'll forget who taught them human behavior mm. or research the you know pr- uh, research or policy. They'll remember the people who taught them the skills. You're right. The classroom instructor, without that, becomes you know. A remnant of the past and maybe the name is even remembered mm-hmm. and i always told my students that you know you may forget who i am but i'm sure that that supervisor that you have who teach you these critical skills of intervent of intervening um you'll, you'll remember them and indeed that's the case i certainly yeah. remember mine um you know it, it, just backtracking on something that you said earlier about you know all these different cultures have very similar issues with the parents and the kids and whatnot and you've obviously had patients that are from a multitude of different backgrounds. Mm-hmm. It's not all the same person. Right. Is there something reoccurring that you see in patients that come to you for help or something like that, or people that you help? Is there anything like that reoccurring that you're, that you, you know, experienced over and over again? Um, the thing that comes to mind is a sense of belonging. Yeah. Uh, people need a sense of belonging. It doesn't matter who, what their background is, but many of the times when people feel disenfranchised from people around them, um, it's very painful. When you feel that you're a part of the group, right? That people look forward to seeing you, they seek you out, you feel that you're a part of something, that is critical. And among that cuts across so many uh, patients that I've seen over the years, you know whether it's feeling a belonging in the home with their parents or with their spouses um, to feeling a belonging at work, you know, that their presence is important, their presence matters. And it doesn't have to be, I mean, you know, I remember a, a young man who was a, a, a file clerk in, in, a, in a hospital uh, file room, you know, the patient records, but it was a sense of belonging mm. that he felt that he went in there every day, he enjoyed his 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 you know uh, coworkers and sometimes it was an emergency and a file had to be found then they would run around and there was camaraderie and that sense was so important and I think you know and socially we all want to be part of something and I think that is a uh, you know a recurring thing how do you how do you get people to have that sense that I'm a part of something people care about me my presence in this group is important however important it is so. Take, take this as an example. I had a young man, this is in the early 90s, who had um, had a tragic uh, childhood with an alcoholic, abusive father who made him drink rum at the age of five. Wow. And insisted that his kid... So, needless to say, this kid's background created a young man who was, you know, uh, involved in drugs and alcohol and, and, and nothing, no, no violent crimes, but... So he did time in prison and in the process, uh, he did drugs and um, was HIV positive. So he, he became my patient. He was released from prison. And it was hard for him to get housing because he was an ex-con. And at that point, 
many uh, landlords didn't want to rent to anybody who had HIV or anything like that or AIDS um, for all sorts of reasons that were irrational, but, but, you know, part of the case. And he said, you know, he would say to me, you know, Dr. Zayas, I, I just don't have a place. My family doesn't want me. I can't get a job. Um, I, I, what am I going to do? And it was hard because there was nothing I could do really. I couldn't convince a landlord. I mean, we did. We managed to get him some resources through the city's human uh, uh, services organization mm. to get him housing. But it was, it was temporary housing. And he said, and he began to tell me about his experiences in prison. When he was in prison, um, he did two things. One, every morning, he made coffee for his cell block. Now, let's imagine that you and I are members of the cell block inmates, right? So my mom sends me my favorite coffee, and your mom sends you your favorite coffee. Well, we would turn it over to him, and we would say, this is how I like our coffee in the morning. So he would have in his cell, with the, with the uh, agreement of the warden and others, that he would make coffee. So he would make your coffee the way you wanted, the one that your mom sent, and he'd make my, and he'd go around, and every morning you and I would enjoy our coffee as we wanted it. At night, he did suicide watch, because again, he had gotten himself in a position with the guards where he, he was a trusted inmate, and he would walk around, keep conversation with the guys. He was not a mental health, he barely had a high school education, he mm. didn't have a mental health background, but he knew when guys were down and out. And those two activities made him feel like he was important and he belonged. And he was telling me now that he was out, he had been released from prison. He said, I can't find housing. I have nothing I can do. He says, all I need to do is go into a bodega and point a fake gun and I'll be back in prison. And you know what, Dr. Zayas? I'll be back to where people care about me. Now, he wanted a place where he could feel belong because on the outside he wasn't. But there was something good that he could do making coffee in the morning and doing suicide watch at night in prison. So you get a sense that, you know, if he belonged nowhere, he knew where he had a sense of belonging and a place that he mattered, whether it was brewing coffee the way you liked it and the way I liked it and the other guys liked it. I mean, he was a trusted member of this small community, right? Like a neighborhood. Everybody, you know, all the, all the other cellmates uh, mm. could rely on him for their coffee. That's, that's powerful. That tells you something about why it's important that people feel a sense of belonging. And when you move from one place to the other, the, you want to find people. Nowadays, we have apps, right? So Meetup, I think, is one of them where you can meet people who are interested in your, you know, your tennis player or golfer or what have you. Maybe the, not those, but you like to dance, a particular dance you know, that nobody else has. You find a group that does. Um, and I think people need that. Um, and and people want to belong. I think it's really mighty so that when we have people who don't look like us or fit in our neighborhood, I think the, the best thing we can do is invite them in rather than ostracize. Because once they, they join in, they become part of the community and they support precisely what you want in your community. They don't take away, they add. Mm. Um, and I think there's some ads on TV about that, about you know the migrants and how we can treat them. I think that that's more important is to make them feel a part of because then they own what they're a part of than to ostracize them. That's an incredible, incredibly powerful, powerful story. Mm. That's mm. wow. Um, I I've had one person on before who was actually in prison. Actually, I don't know if you know, his name's Peter Sloan. No. Okay. He's on the Rhode Island parole board. Uh, first formerly incarcerated person to be on the Rhode Island parole board. Mm -hmm. And he was a social worker and he was, I, he's very similar age to you, I think, and uh, amazing story. Uh, so if you're listening to this episode and you haven't listened to his story yet, you should go back and listen to it. Some really great life lessons in there. Um, but it it's just really interesting to hear that, you know, it's really bad to generalize people and be judgmental. People make mistakes, obviously, in different degrees, and you can argue that if some... Uh, it, it gets to a point where, you know, it's unforgivable. And I certainly agree with that. But with all these, you know, drugs are, they hurt a lot of people. But I think that when it comes to a case like him, right, he's an exception. He's, that's why you can't, you can't generalize all these people because people like him, you know, are, are powerful people. Sure. Like you said, education wise, you know, but like I said, that doesn't really matter. Mm -hmm. He, he understands, you know, how to help people. And I think, you know, maybe 
I mean, there's ways that I think more people can get helped in a way that are very similar to him. And I'm sure there's plenty of other yeah. people that are like that within the system. Mm-hmm. Um, so that's a really powerful yeah, story. I mean, you know, in a lifetime of doing this kind of work, you come up with, you know, you, you find uh, extraordinary stories like this. Um, and another one that sticks in my mind, this is a different kind of type of belonging, but uh, it was a young man that I, it was a teenager that I was treating in the South Bronx, uh, coming to a mental health clinic. His mom was, his mom had died of an overdose of some kind. His father was never around. Uh, and he knew the small area of the Bronx that he lived in. And his, he was now living with an aunt who was very strict, lovely woman, really kept this boy uh, uh, straight and narrow. And um, I, I was able to get him into the Upward Bound program at Fordham University, which was only blocks away mm. from where he lived, but he had never been on that campus. And so we enrolled him there, and he began to like it. And then he, he was feeling like he was betraying his family because here was his march up the social ladder. But in the process, he was leaving behind like the family he knew, the neighborhood he knew. And it, it was a while for him, for, you know, it took a while for me to work with him. And his aunt was very helpful that it's okay. You're not betraying your family. On the contrary, you're going to college means that you are giving your little sister a chance to follow in your footsteps. And maybe what you do can help out your aunt who has become your mom and he loved her like a mother. So it was helping him understand that, yes, this is important to you, but you need to venture out. That Otherwise, you will stay in this little you know, uh, uh, area of the Bronx, South Bronx, and never move out. Mm. So it's, it's that. And then once he was in college, then finding a group that he belonged. And so that sense of moving from one place to another at first being a stranger to it but then being a growing into a part of it where you your presence is felt because you're contributing something it's powerful so it can happen um you know for 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 the 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 young man uh in who came out of prison or this high schooler or some of the folks who have um entered this country you know uh as as immigrants who want to feel that they are they're a part of Mm. it Uh, And I know that one of the things that, and even for my own, I've been a migrant of sorts, having moved around. Um, In in my case, not so much that I'm religious, but I always find a church to affiliate with. And that's always the best place to to begin to meet people and begin to get a sense of belonging and then branch out from there. Mm. And um, when I moved to St. Louis, uh, I was, the, uh, the kids were still in high school, so my wife stood back with them. I thought, well, let me find a church. And, you know, coffee after after the service. And I got to know people. And they told me, oh, you can shop for this here or this is where we meet for that. And that broadens in a, in a kind of very safe uh, and caring community. And uh, when I went to Austin, Texas, did the same thing, although I was at a university. So people at the university were helpful. But I think it's always a good place. And, and you find immigrants will find their, their places of worship, whatever their worship is. And that's where they, they learn about where they can get, you know, uh, lightly used clothes or free handouts or something that they can get them in or where they might be able to land a job and that pays well enough for them to to manage. I think those are it's important. Again, go back to the issue of belonging. Mm, interesting. Well, you know, I really want to talk about and I had mentioned this before we started your TED talk. So for those okay. of you that that know that don't know, Luis did a TED talk and you can search his name TED talk on YouTube and you can watch it. Very powerful speech um and if you want you can sort of give the synopsis of that Mm -hmm. of that speech well in in that talk it was what 14 minutes it was really trying to explain why um we need to treat uh, asylum seekers at the border with greater kindness Mm. than than the immigration experience has been i i began in, uh, in 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 the in the work in 2014 uh and I, the, the appeal was not so much what kind of policies we need to enact, but whatever policies we enact be humane policies. And the way that people were being held in detention, mothers and kids primarily, um, was doing harm, greater harm to them than should have been the case. And in it, uh, I proposed by this time, uh, I believe it was 19, 2020, 2019, that I, I recorded the TED Talk. I had been in the, in the work about five years and it, it seemed to me that at that point, we should have gotten it right. 
-hmm. instead of repurposing old community uh, uh, county prisons and military barracks that we could have created Krampus like environments where where we could process immigrants in a safe way that's safe for the United States in letting them in but also good for and healthy for them. Some of those folks would still be uh, removed to their countries. Some would be let in. But all I was, you know, the appeal is, I think we can do this humanely. And I learned from some of the work that was done uh, in, in the Middle East where refugee camps were created, but they were more in the forms of small towns where people could create neighborhoods and communities mm. and kids had schools <clears throat> and they could ride their bikes to school. It was a refugee camp. There's no doubt about it. And some families would spend years there in that case. But it was the closest thing to being a stable community than anything they yeah. had known. Uh, and so the TED Talk uh, addresses that and how we could do it differently. Well, I'll tell you what. It, it, I watched it. I like to think I'm a pretty open-minded person. You know, I'm obviously young. And I like to think that I know a lot, but I don't. <laughs> and it's always really interesting to hear other people's perspectives on something like this. Um, because it's not, you know, in the mainstream media, you hear these very one-sided arguments or viewpoints, you know, you don't want people in this country. We need to have it like, like lock, you know, locked borders, throw the key away. And then there's the other side of, you know, we need to let everybody in and, and, and whatnot. But your view is a lot more structured than those two extremes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's not straightforward. And I watched it and I was amazed because you were able to bridge the gap between those two extremes. It's not it's not something that is is easy to to really uh, just generalize. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that's what I took away from it is that it, it's it was really like honestly, like I was amazed yes. of the viewpoint. I don't know if you want to get into detail, no, but, but, but or we can just say people can go watch the yeah, TED Talk. Watch it, watch yeah. it. Um, but I, I do recall at one point in the TED Talk, I say, you know, it doesn't matter to be to me if you're Republican or Democrat, yeah. conservative or liberal. That's not what it's all about. I mean, I'm interested in safe borders, yeah. just like every other American is, right? But I think we can do things differently. Yeah. Uh, and that's, that has, is said in the TED Talk. And uh, it is on, on, on TED.com. Uh, and so folks can watch it. The, 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 the idea is that we, we, don't, we don't have to use cruel means to, to uh, uh, help people. I, I, I use the difference between, you know, in the detention centers, we acted as guards. And in the immigration system, we act as guards rather than as guardians. I think we need to think about our role as guardians of people's lives. That still means guardians still control the border, but at least we're not mistreating, mm. uh, mistreating people. And I think that's, that's very important. The other thing is, you know, we come back to the very uh, start of, of today's program, which was about migration and the fact that it's been going on, you know, since the dawn of time. And, it, and it's, it still happens today. And what the sad part is that the last ones who came in begin to shut the door on the next set. Yeah. Right? So um, in, in research for my upcoming book, which is titled uh, Through Ice Boxes and Kennels and uh, subtitled How Immigration Detention Harms Children and Families, I, I went back to do the research. Ben Franklin, 1750-something, said, we don't want the Swedes or the Germans in this country. Mm-hmm. Um, all right, so, so for the book, I was doing research, and back in 1751, I believe it was, Ben Franklin said, you know, oh, we don't want the Swedes in here or the Germans in here because they'll Germanize us before we Anglicize them. Mm -hmm. So um, the idea that, uh, that we resent immigrants is not a 21st century uh, experience. It's been happening all along. Anytime there are newcomers... Um, we we resent them and we reject them. So every group seems to they they come in as immigrants. Uh, they're accepted reluctantly. Then they're absorbed, and then they turn around and don't want to, to, the next group to benefit from what they've had. And I've seen that happen a lot uh, in the U.S. You know, people saying, "Well, yeah, yeah, but my dad came from Ireland or Italy and under similar circumstances, but that was a different time. I don't want anybody else in here today." Uh, I think it's unfair. Uh, 
but it tells you that uh, human, the, hum, the human race is still pretty much the same. We're, we're, we're generally um, not comfortable with, mm. with people who don't look like us or who speak our language or eat our food or dance to our music. Um, and I think that's, that's short-sighted because ultimately, um, you know, human, the human nature, the human spirit is going to persevere and people will, you know, will, will come in. So um, right now, what my, my ideas and the work I do is, is that we simply not necessarily have knee-jerk reactions to people and say, you can't come in, but tell us why you want in and tell us about your background. And then we'll determine whether you can come in, and, but not necessarily lock them up or, or do some of the horrible things that happened in the 2018, for example, family separation policy mm. that was did untold damage to over 5,000 or so kids, 5,500, 6,000 kids who were separated from their parents. We, you know, in the psychology world, that might be a, a podcast for another day, you know, on the on traumatic loss and what the devastating effects are on children whose brains are growing and the architecture and the wiring is taking place. And when they're traumatized this way, the effects on the brain are endure for life, you know, uh, unless you intervene and do psychotherapy and pharmacotherapy to help the person get back on track. But that can be devastating. And I think that's, you know, and we do know that there was an outcry in the U.S. That summer, June, July of, of 2018, I mean, people were saying, no, we can't do that. Even those um, who, who believed in uh, immigration detention but just knew that you don't take a family apart. You don't mm. take, you know, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, babies from parents' arms and put them somewhere else and separate them without explanation. Uh, so that was, you know, I think what we need to do is just simply take on a humane approach to mm -hmm. to how we manage people. Absolutely, busing them, by the way, to Cape Cod or Chicago or Washington is here. Flying them in under uh, all kinds of pretenses isn't the way we should treat people. Mm. Yeah, well, I'm not gonna comment on on that, you know. <laughs> but uh, I, I do because yeah, that's yeah, that's what I believe. Yeah, absolutely, and and you have the right to believe that. Uh, but uh, yeah, well, absolutely amazing conversation, well, Luis. Thank you. I really appreciate you coming on. I mean, a uh, great life story, you know, great experiences. So thank you very much. Thank you for having yeah. me, and and good luck to you on this work. You're doing great work. I think you're giving. Uh, the opportunity for people to get the word out. And I like your approach, which is you're offering people different perspectives. Mm -hmm. You're not you're not drawing any conclusions. It's for the viewers to draw their own conclusions. Exactly. I appreciate that. Yeah, no problem. And uh, yeah, uh, yeah, just great conversation. I'm definitely, this is, I feel like after almost every podcast that I do, I'm like, this has just been a great conversation and it's one of the best ones I've done. But definitely this is a, this is a very impactful conversation. I'm, you know, uh, Sometimes I'll go back and listen to some of the episodes. I'll skip over myself talking just to listen to my guests. And this will definitely be one of those. Oh, good, um, but uh, yeah, thank you very much. And thank you everybody for tuning in the Knowledge is Power podcast today. Make sure to follow us on Instagram uh, to see some cool reels and previews about upcoming podcasts. Also, make sure to uh, follow us on Patreon. If you're interested in getting uh, content before it comes out on Spotify or widely available platforms, uh, you can get podcasts as soon as I record them. I'll upload them to Patreon for as little as $3 a month. You can get early access to episodes. So thank you everybody for listening and I will catch you in the next